Jason Kander served as Secretary of State from, for Missouri from 2013 to 2017. He's also on the board of the Gifford Center to Prevent Gun Violence. He's from Kansas City, a veteran of the Afghanistan war, and he joins me tonight. Um, Jason, it's great to have you on. Um, I'm sorry it's under these circumstances. First, just how are folks there? How are you processing this awful mix uh, of, of joy and celebration and civic pride ending on this horrible note? Yeah, um, heartbreaking is not enough. Um, you know, probably like a lot of people watching right now, it's stunning when you actually stop as an American and think about how many people you know personally have either been the victims of or at least at the scene of mass shootings. And for me, it's quite a few. Uh, and that's before today. Uh, and this is not that big of a town. I promise you. In fact, I've already sadly heard from some people um, that the, for me, this list is, it's going to be bigger. And, and I think that's just increasingly true for so many people watching right now. You're someone who, um, you served in Afghanistan. You had a, a sort of iconic ad, uh, in which you assembled an assault rifle blindfolded or not looking, uh, at, at the weapon, um, but then talked about your views on weapons. You're on the board of, of Giffords. Missouri is a state that's been you know, almost a leader, a forefront, I would say, uh, in the kind of, you know, gun absolutist movement. Um, do you think today changes that at all? Probably not, um, sadly. But I think that that has more to do with the way that this debate has been framed in this country. It's been very successfully framed by gun manufacturers as it's been falsely framed. It's been framed as a debate. And look, we don't know what weapon was used. We don't know motive. We don't know any of that stuff. I'm not talking about today. I'm on because today happened and I'm just pissed off. <laughs> um, and and so I want to talk about this. I want to talk about the fact that they frame this debate as people like me who believe in gun safety versus people who own guns. But I also own a gun. And I don't think that's what's really going on in this country. I think this is between Americans and greedy corporations. They always talk about the Second Amendment, but nobody ever talks about the fact that in 2005, they passed a law that infringes on the Seventh Amendment, which nobody ever hears about. The Seventh Amendment is the amendment to the U.S. Constitution that says if you have in controversy in any matter more than $20, you have a right to a civil jury trial. Well, in 2005, we passed this law. George W. Bush signed it. It's called PLACA. It's the uh, what? something lawful commerce and arms act protection of lawful commerce and arms it's just a fancy way of saying that they gave the gun industry a kind of immunity that nobody who makes literally any other product in this country gets you know how there's like less smoking than there was so many years ago it's not because of congress it's because of lawsuits that's right. the reason my car and your car doesn't flip over on the road because of lawsuits that's why truckers have to get a certain amount of sleep before they get on the road congress didn't do that stuff Lawsuits did that stuff, and everybody likes to demonize them. But when 12 reasonable people can come together, call the jury, and make a decision about what's reasonable in their community, oftentimes they're going to decide, as they started to in the 90s, that gun companies actually can foresee a lot of damage being done and that they can look into who's buying these guns. Now, gun companies, by the way, have... Uh, they they have the ability to make guns smart guns. Most illegal gun crime happens with stolen guns. If smart gun technology were out there, which is never going to get mandated by Congress, you wouldn't have this happen. But if you just you don't have to change a bunch of laws. If you just remove literally like the dumbest law we have on the books, the gun industry is going to police itself. They're going to be begging us to police them because of the liability they're going to have. So that's what I think about in addition to the people in my community who have been hurt. But this is the governmental side of what I think about on a day like today. It makes me very angry. Yeah, I mean, thinking, thinking about this, when I see these images, right, of course, um, you know, the, the danger of just this object, right, and, and it being out there. I and mean, there's all sorts of ways, all sorts of things. There's all the security, there's safety. You got police officers, you got areas taped off. You don't want cars going there, right? There's all sorts of ways in which the space is protected and regulated. And yet this this one device, which is a particularly deadly and dangerous device, and we have more of them in our country than anywhere else, is going to end up at a scene like that, as we're seeing now. And the aftermath of it will be predictable. And we have to find some way of attacking that. And I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. 
Yeah, thank you. What they do is they, they try and overwhelm us with the difficulty of the problem. They mm. say over and over again, like on assault weapons, they say, well, how are you going to define what an assault weapon is? Which is a stupid question, but let's pretend it's not for a second, right? Or they'll say, uh, well, how are you going to, you know, they'll say, uh, well, this crime or that crime was committed with a gun that was already illegal. It was illegal for them to have a gun. Oh, and then you say, well, should we perhaps pass smart gun technology and require it? They say, well, how are you going to define that? Well, the answer is you just let juries do it over and over and over again. And pretty soon, the gun companies, here's what they're going to do. I promise you, not only are they going to do all these things on their own to avoid losing their butt in court all the time, they're going to end up making a ton of money because they'll start gun insurance, side companies, subsidiaries. And then you know what you'll have? You'll have a registry of guns because they can't create a need for gun insurance hmm. if they don't know everybody who owns their guns. So they're going to make plenty of money if we do it the other way. They don't want to do anything difficult. So all we got to do is get rid of one stupid law and a whole lot of the things that we need in order to keep people safe in this country are going to happen. Jason Kander, a uh, proud son of Kansas City, uh, and great to have you on. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances. Great to see you, though, sir. Thanks, Chris. We've got the results of the first special election of 2024, and it was a huge loss for Republicans. In New York's 3rd Congressional District, Democrat Tom Suozzi defeated Republican Mozzie Pillup by nearly eight points. Suozzi will now replace the expelled, criminally indicted former Congressman George Santos, bringing Republicans' already tight majority in the House down to just six seats. Now, you might think, the day after, that the party would be wondering where they went wrong after such a crushing loss in what was supposed to be a neck-and-neck -neck tight race. George Santos won this same district by nearly eight points just over a year ago. Instead, Republicans are defiant in their defeat. The chair of the New York Republican Party, Ed Cox, released a statement saying in part, quote, Republicans will win this scene in November when the campaign resets to focus on Joe Biden and Democrats' disastrous open borders, soft on crime policies, rather than the specific circumstances that brought about this election. And I got to say to me, this statement perfectly defines the difference between the two major parties. Republicans approach each election with a kind of unbridled, undeserved confidence. They believe the voters are with them. They think they represent real Americans and therefore the real majority of the country. According to Republicans, Democrats are the party of the out-of-touch elite, the freaks, minorities. So Republicans should not have to think about whether their message is working or whether they are running good candidates. It is simply their destiny. It is their fate to be voted into power. But of course, what we keep seeing over and over in 2020, 2022, and now 2024 is that the majority of Americans do not like the candidates Republicans are running or the messages they are pushing. And the party refuses to learn that lesson in election after election. They run unlikable candidates on ridiculous issues, and they lose. Mozzie Pillip was a soldier who fought terrorism, who support stronger borders and lower taxes. Tom Swazi opened the border. Tom Swazi funding the sanctuary city. We will wage a war on the woke. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. I'm Dave White, and I'll never let CRT be taught in our classrooms. There's nothing racist about stopping critical race theory. we got to get this transgender ideology out of our schools. My senior year, I was forced to compete against a biological male. That's unfair and wrong. Which one of you is from the New York Times? You know there's only two genders, right? Every one of those candidates lost, but the Republican Party didn't learn from Curry Lake and trans swimmers or Josh Mandel and CRT or Ron DeSantis in the war on woke. They won't learn from Mozzie Pillup and crime in the border either. Imagine, though, for a moment, if the shoe were on the other foot. I mean, it was totally possible, right, that we wake up this morning and the Democrat had lost this race in New York. And just imagine, imagine the amount of second guessing that would be circulating in the party, in progressive and center left circles, in the mainstream press, on the op-ed pages of The New York Times. It would be constant because the Democratic Party and the larger coalition is in a near constant state of anxiety. They're always worried that their coalition will crack, that they will lose the support of real Americans. I think part of that is, is because the party apparatus is, in fact, dominated by college educated people living in big metro areas, big cities, who make up a disproportionate number of campaign, political staffers, actual elected officials and the media. And especially since 2016. That group of folks really does fear they're missing something, something key about what voters not in those circles think. 
Now, that fear that they're missing something can be pretty neurotic and debilitating. It's the source of, like, the, you know, hundreds of diner safari pieces we've all read. But I will say this. I think it's also an important, helpful effect. The whole point of politics and elections is to win the support of a majority of people. So if you're always worried about losing them, you have to really engage with what the voters think and feel, how to reach them. It does, I think, keep the Democratic Party tethered to reality, while Republicans increasingly are just about the opposite of that. They are so convinced of their own virtue, they've completely lost sight of the fact that on a lot of topics, they're the ones that actually sound like freaks and weirdos. They are so certain they are the real Americans, they cannot see how far they are from them. Here's a perfect example. Republicans, about how lost Republicans are. The conservative uproar about Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. Somehow Republicans are threatened by the image of the towering, square-jawed, conventionally handsome star athlete kissing his blonde, red-lipped, conventionally attractive pop star girlfriend. He's from Ohio, plays for Kansas City. She got her start in Nashville with country music. She's Miss Americana, and he's the heartbreak prince. It's like a 1950s James Dean daydream. They are quintessentially middle America, conservative coded as it gets. And Republicans have so alienated themselves from actual middle America that this is a threat to them now. They can't hear it, though. They cannot learn from it. They cannot course correct. They keep attacking America's prom king and queen. They plan to run Mozzie Pillip again in New York's 3rd District in November, and she'll run on the same issues. And they still support Donald Trump. Because when you believe that you never have to listen to what the voters are telling you, you can pretend that you won an election that you lost by 7 million votes.